the Chaim for your father. Thanks, Rav. Which is coming up this Shabbos. Um, David? Dove. Is it Dove? No, David. I thought your father was the well, I thought your father was David. Dove is a different name to David. Oh, that's right. You're David Ben Dove. Aha, can't be. Okay, that's the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got Dove in my name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. From Ellen Wheel and from Steve Escher. I saw Steve. Uh, okay. And it's uh, uh, and from Ashley. Okay. Okay. So, gentlemen, basically, I'll try to cover a little bit of ground over here. Um, yeah. Where is that? Where is that thing to annotate? Oh, there, there he is. I was looking for that that pointer thing. Uh, move it a bit closer. Can you see there, Jeff? Yeah, I can see. That. Okay. So basically, just to give us a little bit of context. Yeah. So we were discussing, we came to a new Mishnah last week. You got the place, has everyone got it? I'm, I'm going to read from the Mishnah again and just say one or two things. I'm not reading from before the Mishnah, but just to uh, to say outside prior to the Mishnah, the Mishnah is Rabbi Yossi Oymer Sheikhek Vazir al that was the new mission we started. Yeah, this one here. Yeah. Exactly. Everybody got that. Um, it would be 19 if it's Safari. Safari line 19. So basically, the prior to this mission, the Gomorrah had discussed the previous mission. Thanks. Can you see? You see clearly. No, no, the Gomorrah had discussed the previous Mishnah, which spoke of various different discussions. How do you tell if an ornamental object or some kind of implement, be it clothing, be it jewelry, whatever it is, has an image printed on it, sculpted on it, engraved on it? And is that image idolatrous or not? And the Gomorrah brought a machloikas because the Mishnah had spoke about two different kinds of implements or vessels. Oh. It spoke about mechubadin, which were honorable things, and mevuzin, which are less than honorable things. And the Mishnah had pointed out that when you find that image on something honorable and choshev and important, it is likely to be idolatrous. And if it's not honorable and important, it's less likely to be idolatrous. I'm just getting us up to context. And Shmuel had said that the difference between the two was the type of keili that it is. The type of vessel. In other words, if it's more of a utilitarian vessel, I think that's how the word goes, utility, utilitarian thing, like clothing or towels or not even important clothing, but regular clothing, then that would be, or pots and pans and whatever, uh, kitchen things, tools, those kind of vessels that are more for utility use, they're not for status, they're not for status and they're not for so-called... Uh, high level decoration so those kind of things an image on them is more likely not to be an idolatrous image but when it comes to very important things like jewelry and the gomorrah outline bracelets and nose rings and other kinds of jewelry if the image is on these higher level things that people wear for status they wear them because it looks good and it's important and it has an aesthetic appeal it's not just uh, for a utility purpose, then those things can more likely be idolatrous images. And in fact, that is how the halacha is ruled. The halacha is ruled that when a person sees an image on something, let's say you buy something, and you see an image on something that's engraved, and you want to know whether or not it's a risk that it's one of those images that is considered to be idolatrous, the most important thing is what is it on? If it's on a, how would you call it, a brooch or a necklace or a bracelet, all those things are considered important because they enhance a person. When a person puts on things like that, it enhances our appearance. It makes us look more important. And therefore, an image on those that's one of the questionable images would be a bigger problem. And that was the discussion that we had all the way to the Mishnah. Then we read the Mishnah. When it came to the Mishnah, the Mishnah started with a new subject, which was with regard to the destruction of Avodah Zarah. So when it comes to Avodah Zarah, when it comes to idolatrous objects, there's obviously a few different issues that apply, a few different challenges. 
The one is that because it is the deity of another religion, it's Elohim Achelim, as we call it. Number one is you shouldn't serve it. You shouldn't um, you, you, you shouldn't get involved as a Jew in worshipping it the way that the non-Jews would worship it. Or some Jews who are not doing what they're supposed to do. It doesn't have to be non-Jews. Um, you should not be worshipping another deity besides Hashem alone. As it says in the Pasuk, that you'll say, Eicho yavdu agoyim ha'ele eselohayim ve'ese kain gamoni. Moses said to the Jewish people in the land of Canaan, you'll say, how do they serve their gods? And perhaps I'll do the same. Don't copy it. You're not supposed to copy it and do those kind of things. So the one issue is the actual service. The other issue is the making of these idols. Are you allowed to make them? What happens if you're in the business of making it, but you're not in the business of serving it, so you want to manufacture the Avodah Zara for somebody else. And the other thing is an Isur Hano, a prohibition of benefit. You find the thing lying around. It belongs to somebody else, but now you have found it and you want to take over it or utilize it. What is the rule? Can you? Maybe you have a different purpose for it. But sometimes you can't enjoy that different purpose because there is what's called an Isur Hano, a prohibition of benefit. And then the other thing is there's actually a chiyuv, there's an obligation in many cases where a Jew actually has to so-called get rid of, destroy the deity that belongs to, the, the deity that is avoid the Zara. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it, it's obviously the certain things you can't destroy because you can't. Um, it would be, so, okay, so, so it would be a shayla, it would be a question because of the fact that it would take us into the whole question of which other religions of the famous religions of the world are actually Avedo Zara. And there are different points came with different views on that. Whether whether amongst the major religions of the world, whether the Salem, as it's called, is actually Avedo Zara or not. Certainly not our favorite symbol. It's other people's symbol in a new and uh, free world. We don't go around chopping off other people's heads because of what they do. It is good to have a bit of tolerance and uh, understanding in the world that we live. However, with regard to ourselves, practically, if you're in, uh, how would you call it, the jewelry business, um, we have some people that are right here, rail on the Zoom. And you man manufacturing jeweler, you make things, and an, a person comes to you and asks you to make a piece for them that might represent symbolically something in their religion. You'd have to go to a rabbi who's a specialist in that area and ask your Shaila your question in a, as a specific targeted question. Because all situations are different. Um, Michael asked about a cross. Again, it would be a whole debate because there are different poiskim who have different views on it. Um, the different views on it are that the question is which of the major religions of the world are actually Avoid Zara. And you might wonder why or why not. Um, as we've spoken many times, there are different definitions of idolatrous service of a desire. The Gentiles of the world are entitled to a certain amount of leeway, believe it or not, that we not. And you know what that is? That's called shittuf, which means partnership. They are allowed to believe that Hashem has, to some extent, devolved or delegated certain powers into other things in the world, that although he is the balabos, but maybe he's the CEO of the world, but he's got his, uh, how would you call it, his agents, that through them, in certain specified ways, there are situations where people are allowed to accept that maybe a certain amount of power has been devolved to other things, whereas a Jew is not allowed to even go that route. But us, Hashem Echad, that God is absolutely and essentially one, is a cornerstone of what we have to believe, that, that, that the fact that there could be anything separate is is totally is an illusion um but coming back over here one of the issues that we've dealt with is the concept where we have an obligation to destroy something because it's a way to zara we got to get rid of it and in the mishnah we did read it last week already but we can have a look at it again because there were certain things we actually didn't unpack about this mishnah last week the mishnah spoke about and we said there's different ways to get rid of avoid the zara Sorry, at the Mishnah Rabbi Yossi Oimer, Sheikhik Vazoya Laruach, Matul Ayam. We did read it a lot, you got it. Um, we, so the question is, is grinding it 
and throwing it into the wind or throwing it into the sea, considered destroying it. And uh, what I wanted to point out, which we didn't last week, is that on this opinion of Rabbi Yossi, in another Gemara, there is an argument between two Amiraim, two Gemara sages, Rabbi and Rav Yosef. So it's a bit confusing here, Yosef and Yossi. So it's almost the same, but not the same. Rav Yosef and Rabbi, who are two Gemara sages, <laughs> Rav Yosef, <laughs> But Yosef and Yossi is actually comes from the same name. It's just yeah, how they were so referred to. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Same root. Yeah. It's the same root. So uh, Rav Yosef and Rabba are actually in a machlokas in a debate with regard to Rabbi Yossi's opinion. And what is their debate with regard to his opinion? There's a there is in this Mishnah that we read, and uh, we'll revise it and, and read it again. <laughs> um, Rabbi Yossi is saying that if you have something that is avoid the Zora and you need to get rid of it, so he provides two options. You grind it up and then you can throw it into the air or into the sea. Uh, you can throw it into the air or you can throw it into the sea, which in this case is a reference to the Dead Sea. That was their, their favorite place. I don't think it would matter if it was another sea, but you could throw it into a body of water like a sea where it's not going to come up again. Now, the, according to Rubber, the the um, the precondition that it has to be ground first applies to the sea and throwing it into the air. In other words, either way, Rabbi Yossi wants this thing ground up and completely dismantled. And once it's in many fine pieces, then you can choose if you want to just chuck it into the air, which basically means you're going to have little piles of dust or pebbles or whatever type of particle comes from that material, but you have destroyed or dismantled or gotten rid of this idolatrous figure, statue, ornament, whatever it is. But whether it's the sea or whether it's the air, it needs to be ground. And um, and and according to that, that's that's that is how Rabbi sees it. According to Rav Yosef, that Rabbi Yosef and his colleagues, the Tanoim, the sages in the time of the Mishnah don't have any difference of opinion over the sea. When it comes to the sea, you don't need grinding. The sea is big enough, and what's the word, treacherous enough, that even if you plonk the whole thing in, in one piece, it's considered gotten rid of. Nobody's going diving there to get it out whole. Whatever, it's most likely that something over there is going to destroy it. A shark might mistake in it for his lunch. Um, no, the dead sea, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No the, dead, the, the, the dead sea, yeah, it the would be apparent, the, the, the salt the will corrode it, won't it? The salt no, will, but, if but it's it metal, be, it yeah, mm. metal, by far metal, by but metal. either way, whether it preserves or not, according to um, according to Rav Yosef, which is different to Rabba, Rabbi Yosef, and the and, and the sages are both happy with this thing being thrown into the water hole, it does need to be ground up. The grinding argument, whether you need to grind or you don't need to grind, is all about throwing it into the air. I mean, if you're throwing it into the air and you don't destroy it, I mean, you're just basically throwing the same thing across the road. And if it's a hard thing, somebody might pick it up on the other side of the road, take it to a panel beater for the one dent that you caused and carry on using it as an idol. So it would be according to... Um, it would be according to Rabbi Yossi that you have to grind it and according to the sages that the grinding is not good enough. The whole argument about grinding is only about, not about the water, it's about the air. And so that's just another Gemara which unpacks this argument. The main thrust of our Gemara, which we started last week, is whether grinding is a form of destruction at all. Is it good enough to grind something into pieces and get rid of it like that? Is it good enough? What happens um, if, the, if the object is gold? You still have to grind it up, wouldn't you? You couldn't use it. Um, if the object, I think it would apply to anything, but then you have to grind it fine enough Not that it disappears all over the place. Because if it remains, because gold, if the dust is accumulated in one in one mm -hmm. area, then you're going to have a valuable substance mm -hmm. that could be melted and reconstituted, mm -hmm. and then you so, have a problem. That uh, yes, rail. Sorry, question. So if if the if the idol is made of gold and you melted it 
Which yeah. Would be the same as grinding it. I mean, you're destroying it completely. It sounds like you'll see the discussion in the rest of the Gomorrah. It sounds like melting and grinding is similar from a malachic point of view. The only thing is, if there's a Isur Hano, which means you're not allowed to have benefit, then the melting could be a problem because then you could be turning it into a useful, a useful substance that will now be recycled or used for something else. And when yeah. we talk about grinding it in a way that the particles go in all different directions or into the water, that's proper destruction. You can't recover it. We're talking about destroying it in a way that it's irrecoverable. So if you're melting or grinding in a way that you're recycling, that's no good because there's a isur hana, there's a prohibition to a benefit. Okay. In, in many cases, mm -hmm. sometimes there isn't a prohibition for benefit, as the Gomorrah will say, and then it's fine. It's fine to melt it, grind it, and reuse it. And he'll give examples. So we'll read the Mishnah again. Um, and the Mishnah is a particularly good time to have your Yortzad names in mind because Mishnah is uh, exactly what is said for Nashamas. Um, so once again, it's Reb Dov Ben. Dov Ben Tuvia Halevi. Rabbi Yossi Omer, Rabbi Yossi said, Sheikhik Vazayra la Ruach, a person can grind an idol, throw it to the wind, or matil la yom, or throw it in the sea. Amrulai, the sages challenged them and they said, Afunas is Zevel, this is going to become some kind of compost or fertilizing mineral. Shanemar, as it says, um, nothing of the prescribed or prohibited thing should remain stuck in your hand. So they're asking, how does grinding help if the ground, if the ground particle is going to have benefit? So you'll recognize a few of these lines. We did read them last week, especially some really uh, interesting ones. Tanya, so we learned in Abraisa, so I'm going to read fast because I want to get to the place that we didn't read yet. We learned in Abraisa, Amalem Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yossi said, um, so he said, wasn't there the case of the Egel Azov, the golden calf that Moses ground? So isn't that a precedent that you are allowed to grind away the Zorah? And he quotes the verse in Deuteronomy, as for your sin, Asher Asisem was eagle that you made the golden calf. And Moshe recounts the story because he's talking to the Jewish people. This was a historical repeat of the story of the golden calf. I took it. I put it in fire. And I ground it very fine. How far until it was very fine dust. And I threw the dust into the stream that was coming down the mountain. So if Moses could grind the golden calf, then why can't we grind any idolatry that we're trying to get rid of? So Rabbi Yes is trying to use that as a proof in, in his corner of the court that it's okay to grind. The, the sages answered, they said, no, 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 you'll recall this. It's not a riot, it's not a proof because he was grinding it to make to make a drink, to make a special milkshake that would test them. Amaloi, <laughs> they said to him, is Shamraya, is that a proof? It says, Shmay Slam al-Bais Khafat says in Exodus, by the story of the golden calf itself. Notice the Gemara is quoting two times the Torah talks about the same incident. In Devarim, it was Moshe repeating it years later. This is what happened. In Shmois, in Exodus, it was actually when it when it actually happened. It, the Pasuk says, Vayizer al Amayim, he strewed it over the water, Vayashkes b'nei Yisrael, and he gave it to the children of Israel to drink. It was a test. His intention was to test them like you test the Sota, an unfaithful woman, by giving her a solution to drink. So basically, when they drank that, if they were not committed to Hashem and Torah ideals, it was dangerous, doesn't say exactly what would happen, but it wasn't the healthiest drink, and it would wipe them out. And if they, just like with the Sota, when she drank that solution, if they were true to Hashem, then they were fine, and they were actually blessed, even though they drank it. The point that the Gemara is making is that the reason Moshe grounded it was in order to create the test, not because that's how he needed to, to destroy it. Um, yeah. To create a test, to make a solution, a powder solution, a powdered shake, a special kind of chiller shake that they had to drink. In other words, that, that was the reason for grinding it. So the, in other words, the people arguing with Rabbi Yossi are saying, 
don't bring a proof from there that that's how you get rid of an idol by grinding it because there was a, 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 a ulterior purpose for grinding over there. Then the Gomorrah moved on to a story in Chronicles, Divrei Hayamim, um, where the King Asa, who was a good king, came along and he also had to destroy idols and abominable things, some particularly bizarre. And it says over there that he he ground and he burnt. So again, it's another raya where Yosh is trying to defend himself. You see that King Asa came along and he wanted to get rid of all the idols and the evil stuff, including stuff that his own mother, who was a very wicked lady, had made. Yeah. And what did he do? He, uh, he he burnt it in a furnace and he ground it. Amalem Rabbi Yosi, Rabbi Yosi says to them, doesn't it say in Divrei Ayamim, in Chronicles, with Games Macho Imoy, and even his mother Macho, Siro Migvira, Asher Osiso Miflatsta Bakoimir, he took her down from being a queen and an important person. And because she made an abominable idol, Vayidek Vayisrek Benach Kidrain, he ground it, he burnt it in the Kidrain stream. So again, isn't that a proof that that's what you're supposed to do? Look at the handbook, see what a great king like Asa did. That's what he did. He burnt it, he ground it. Amaloi said to him, Shomraya, from there a proof. In other words, that's not a proof. Why? It's not a proof. Because the stream of Kidron is a stream where the land around it doesn't allow anything to grow. It's an arid place that doesn't have an ability to grow anything. So that's why he could put ground uh, substances from these idols and abominable things there. The problem is, if you put it in a place in fertile ground that can grow things, you're going to cause that the minerals that you ground enhance the ground, two different kinds of grinding. <laughs> the things that you have, the grindings that you have ground will enhance the, uh, the ground as in the earth ground, and that's not allowed. You now will be not destroying, but converting it to a to a benefit of sorts so that so uh the answer was that this particular stream called kidron does not allow anything to grow hence it was permissible to put the shavings and the grindings of the idol there as king asa did what does the gomorrah do gomorrah will always take the other side and the gomorrah says no i'll prove to you that by the nachal kidron there was very fertile growing places and how do we know this the Gemara says, we know that in the time of the Beit HaMikdash, the bloods from the slaughtered sacrifices would flow. They would flow underground and they would flow through the drainage system and they would flow into the Kidron stream. And when they would flow into the Kidron stream, they would benefit the very fertile area that's there. Belay, and are you saying no? In other words, are you saying that near the stream of Kidron is going to be uh, areas that you can't grow anything. We are Tanya, we learnt in a Braisa, Eilu, Eilu, these as well as those, meaning the bloods that come about from the big altar and the bloods that come about from the small altar. Masarvin Ba'amo, they mix with Yotzin and Nachal Kidron, and they flow to the stream called Kidron of Anim Karin Laganonin, and they are sold to the gardeners. You know, the people that like to grow their beautiful plants, they want to have the best quality fertilizer. They want the what are they called horticulturists the people that grow very very uh, uh very exotic plants and they actually used to take the blood that came from the temple courtyard and they would buy it for zevel it was a type it was a very very good kind of fertilizer the zevel but the warning was that that could be considered what's called <laughs> misuse or misappropriation of consecrated property because the animals and the offerings in the temple were holy and consecrated generally people didn't have uh, a right and allowance to use those things however the sages said that these bloods that flowed out they were allowed to use it it's not here in the direct wording but in the commentaries provided that they paid for it in other words because they paid it was considered a redemption so in other words, the farmers liked it, so they would figure out the value of it, and that value they would pay to the Gizbar, the treasurer of the temple, and they would redeem these bloods, and they would use it in order to fertilize the, the, the farming land that was near this Kidron stream, and, 
and they would and, and they would benefit from it. Now, why does he mention all of this? Because we just said a few lines ago that this is an area that you can't use fertilizer. And here's a whole Mishnah, a whole Brisa, explaining how the farmers could redeem these bloods in order to grow their stuff. To that, the Gemara answers, Mekomis, Mekomis, Yesh. Mekomis, Mekomis, Yesh, boy. There were different places. There were parts of the Kidron stream where you could grow things and fertilize things. There were other parts near the Kidron stream where you couldn't grow anything. Yesh, Mokim, Megadol, Tzmeichen. There were places where things could grow. But Yesh, Mokim, Sha'in, Megadol, Tzmeichen. And there were places where things could not grow. So in other words, it's not a stira. It's not a contradiction. The Gemara resolves it. When we said that you could take ground up uh, elements of idols, or that that's what Asa did when he ground those abominable things that were made in his time by idolaters, he made sure to put the grindings in parts of the ground near the Kidron stream that were not fertile, that couldn't grow anything. So he wasn't enhancing the ground there. But the other parts of that same river, where the banks or the land next to it can grow. And that's what this Bryson means when it says that people would want the bloods from the temple in order to fertilize what they could grow. So it's very easily resolved. It's the same river. And certain places near that river, you could grow things. And certain places near the river, you couldn't grow things. Didn't but we... Didn't so, God with his hip sorry? When they use it, with hip. When they used what? The, when they used the, the, the bloods. Now, when they used the bloods, so yeah, the interesting thing, the interesting thing is that according to the commentaries on the Gemara, it wasn't Ma'ila Midoraisa, which means that because it came from the bloods that were drained out, it wasn't actually a Torah prohibition of misuse of consecrated stuff. But the rabbis anyways wanted people to be careful. So therefore they said you have to pay for it. By paying for it, you redeem it. In other words, if your bucket of, uh, of, of, of bloods that came out of the temple drainage system, a farmer would say that, I don't know, a guy selling agricultural implements would charge X amount for such a bucket of, uh, how would you call it, of good quality um, fertilizer, animal fertilizer, which comes even from the blood of the animal. So that value, whatever it was worth, had to be paid back to the to the gizbar, as we said, to the temple treasury. By paying for it, you redeemed it. But the whole redemption, according to most of the Mepharshim on this Gemara, was what's called Midr Abonin. It was a rabbinic safeguard. You know, there's a difference between, in other words, Me'ila Midoraisa, that means misuse of something consecrated, as a Torah law, is very specific. Because if you misuse something, Midoraisa, what you see in many places, it doesn't help just to simply cover it. You get a fine besides covering it. It's not that uh, you can put your hands up and say, I'm sorry, I used an animal that belonged to the temple treasury. There were all kinds of laws. Sometimes you had to replace double, okay, a kofel, and sometimes you had to replace more than double. Sometimes you had to pay a penalty of 20%. Um, so ma'ila midoraisa, misusing something from a Torah perspective, is a, uh, is a more severe prohibition. But the main reason the Gemara brought this whole discussion was because of the fact that it wanted to indicate that there are, in fact, certain parts near that river that are fertile. And back to our King Asa, if he ground abominable idols and took their grindings and put it there, it wouldn't be okay because he'd be enhancing the ground with the ground uh, dust of idols. And that's why the Gemara explained, don't worry. It's easy to understand that there were parts that allowed things to grow and parts that didn't allow things to grow. So what's coming out is if you are going to use grinding as a way of getting rid of an abominable avoid sort of thing, you have to be sure that that which you've ground, the particles don't become a benefit or a fertilizer for something else. So now um, the Gomorrah asks a question on the side. In fact, this is actually exactly where we left off. But I'm happy we repeated these lines because there were some parts that I didn't catch last week. Um, the expression of something abominable that the mother of the king made. My miflatsta, what is a miflatsta? An abominable thing. Amar of Yehuda, Rav Yehuda said, the have it comes from the words mafli leitzanusa. You know, we have in uh, in our, what you call it, in, in our prayer for health in the morning, Asha Yotzar, we say, that we say Hashem is wondrous with the human body in the way that he created the human body. 
he, it's it's wondrous. So she, you know, how would you call it? There was an intense and wondrous abominable factor to what she did. And what did she actually do? She had a type of idol, which was turned into, uh, how's the best way to say this euphemistically without being too crude? It was some kind of immoral toy. It was an implement used for uh, immoral use. You know, different idols or different things that they utilized were used in different ways. There were some they prayed to and some that they did other things with. And so sometimes they would use them for bestiality. They would use them for any kind of activity that was not necessarily, uh, that was that was not of a holy and pure kind. Important to mention, it's quite interesting that you often see avoid the Zara and Gilei Arayas together. It's interesting. The three cardinal problems. Well, what's it? Avoid the Zara, idolatrous behavior. Gilei Arayas means immorality. Um, and Shvichas Domim is, is murder. And it's interesting how often these things will come in tandem uh, one with the other. Like we know with the Midianites, that's what they did to our people, Bolak and Bilam, when Bilam couldn't succeed to curse B'nai Israel. So what did he say to Bolak? Let's bring out the princesses and we'll cause the Jewish people to falter with the princesses of Midian, but it wasn't just to fault it with immorality, the they would also entice them to their gods, to their, their pagan worship. Um, and this is precisely where we where we actually were. The, um, the next suggestion that Rabbi Yossi makes, he talks about the Nechash Nechashes. If you remember, there was a time... There was a time in the uh, in, in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu in the wilderness that the people were naughty. Our people were naughty a few times, and a plague broke out that started to kill the people. And Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu that the way to solve this is to make an achash nechoshes. He gave him a recipe to make a copper snake and to put it on the post. And when people looked at the copper snake on the post, that was their cure. It stopped the plague. Remember a famous story, it's written in the Torah, that Moshe Rabbeinu made a serpent out of copper, and he put the Nechash Nechash, the copper serpent, up on a post, and all the people who were plagued um, looked up at the Nechash Nechash. Um, it was called, I think it was made by a company called Pfizer. It was called the miracle vaccine that stopped the, that stopped the epidemic. Until three days later, they pretty much discovered it wasn't working at all. But um, but Lahavdal, uh, this worked very really well. Huh? How was not that avoided? <laughs> Sorry, uh -huh. so now that's what the discussion is about the copper snake. So so Rabbi Yosi said, um, so Moshe Rabbeinu made this copper snake, which I went off a tangent a little bit there, and the copper snake solved the plague. When the people looked at it, they survived. In the meantime, the copper snake remained around. Seems like somebody put it in a cupboard somewhere. And it remained around. And many years later, in the time of Chizkiah, the king, there were Jews that turned it into an Avodah Zorah. They found the copper snake that Moshe had made. He intended it as a, uh, as a plague vaccination. No, people <laughs> looked yeah, at, people snake, looked at it exactly. Yeah, yeah, they looked at it. I mean, yeah, yeah. He intended it for that purpose. It would seem it was a once-off purpose. And but down the line, some people found it and turned it into an Avodah Zarah. They started to serve it. So what happened? Chizkiah Hamelech came, King Chizkiah, and he put it through the grinding machine. He said, if they're going to, if they are going to serve this thing as Avodah Zarah, then I need to get rid of it. And he ground it. Now, Rabbi Yossi says, let me say that that's my proof that you can grind something that's Avodah Zarah. Well, and Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yosef said, well, doesn't it say Malachim Bays in Kings 2? That Chizkiah came along in his time and he ground the copper snake that Moses made. In other words, it was causing trouble, wasn't behaving. So he ground that snake. Is now, that isn't snake? that the original snake? So the question is, if that's the case, then isn't that an, another indicator that grinding, you know, you, the discussion here is to try and work out, is grinding 
the way to get rid of Avodah Zarah. And that's Rabbi Yossi's opinion versus all the others. So they answer, no, nope, it's not a proof. You know why it's not a proof? And I'll say it outside. Because the way it works with Avodah Zarah is a person can only cause the effect of Avodah Zarah on something that belongs to him. I can't come and turn what's not my property into Avodah Zarah. I can't take your property, your statue, your ornament, whatever it might be that belongs to you or to others, and turn it into Avodah Zarah. The, 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 the main person to turn something, God forbid, into Avodah Zarah is the one who makes it or the one who owns it. It's his. And this copper snake belonged to Moshe Rabbeinu. And the Gemara proves that. And even many years later, he never gave it up. It was still his. So even though the people misused it in terms of the way they worshipped it, the it. truth of the matter was, it could be theft, whatever it is, but, or misuse, misappropriation, those are all yeah. separate issues. But from the point of view of destroying it, it didn't need to be destroyed as an Avodah Zarah. Why? Because it didn't belong to them. They didn't have the power to cause it to be full-blown Avodah Zarah. Why did Chizkiah want to grind it? Because he didn't want them to do that. He didn't want them to misbehave. It could also be a safeguard. If they pray to this snake, the next thing, you don't do anything about it. The next thing, this group might make another one. Somebody might say, you know, we need one in the south. We need another one in the north. And the one that's theirs would be a bigger problem because they own it. So Amrulay, they said to Misham Raya, is that a proof? Harayu Oimer, it says, if you look at the apostle carefully in Bamidbar, in Numbers, where Moshe Rabbeinu is instructed by Hashem to make this copper serpent. If you look, look at the exact words. Hashem said to Moshe, make yourself a sarof, a serpent. The word means from your own. God is telling Moshe Rabbeinu, I want you to spend your money making this thing. Don't bull anybody else. In other words, part of the way this is going to work is it has to come from Moses, from Moshe's own money. It's got to be his. But what do we see? That therefore, it worked and it was good, but it wasn't anybody else's. It belonged to Moshe Rabbeinu. It belonged to the leader. So, a person cannot prohibit something that does not belong to him. So the Gemara says, so therefore, strictly speaking, but then, in other words, according to the law, this thing did not need to be ground. It was ground because Hezekiah felt it was in everybody's best interest to dismantle it and to not have it around. But it didn't need to be gotten rid of as a chiyuv, as an obligation to be ground because it belonged to Moshe, not to them. By the way, in Halacha itself, this is Gemara, but in Halacha itself, it does, there are views, and I think we go according to them, that you can actually make something into a Zorah that belongs to someone else. If the Mesa is strong enough, if it's done with action. So basically that means that there are, the say, our sages say that if you just pray to it or worship it in an indirect way, then it makes a difference whether it's yours or somebody else's. You know, you walk in at somebody else's ornament, you start bowing and praying. That's not active. But there is a view that if you get active, that means that you actually, let's Say maybe you once again are a bit of a sculptor or an engineer or whatever, and you take the thing even without permission and you start reshaping it and you get active about what you do, you rebold it, you add, you subtract, whatever it is, then even though it belongs to someone else, you can have an effect as a Jew can have of turning somebody else's property into Avodah Zara. He might have a property claim on you, you never mind us. He might be able to take you to base him and say, Now you've cost me because you've turned. My assets, useless. We've basically taken something that belongs to me, and now I can't use it anymore because you made it into Avodah Zarah, and I'm a, a observant Jew. I can't use it anymore. So whatever the value of the thing is as a business matter, you owe me damages. You've damaged my thing. Just like if you burn it or you lose it or you break it, now you've turned it into Avodah Zarah. You have spiritually damaged an asset that belongs to me. That's a claim of Dine Mamonis. But according to Halacha, the the, um, the 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 halachic authorities point out that this concept that you can't make somebody else's tools and stuff of Avodah Zarah is talking about more indirect kind of worship. But when a person is active once again, 
that they can actually turn somebody else's thing into a way to Zara. Mm -hmm. um, so wouldn't it uh, uh, be the um, um, the the uh, the children of the children of Moshe? Surely they would it would devolve down to them over the years. You mean become their possession? Yeah. It seems not. It seems that they didn't. Um, so yeah. So sorry. So the Gemara said. Um, yeah. It's, but it seems it wasn't public property. It might have, if it was public property, like let's say an organization or a shul, whatever, it seems that for some reason, which is probably explained there, Hashem specifically wanted that that particular Nechash Nechoshes should belong to Moshe. He should hold the, the ownership of it. Um, so the Gemara says here, yeah, because Chizkiah saw that the Jewish people erred in their ways, uh, Basra after it, Omad Vichitaisu. So he went and he he chopped it or so he ground it. It's just continue, it's just finishing off what we were saying before that his reasoning was the people were making uh, trouble with it, therefore let's go and cut it up. But it wasn't that he was demonstrating to people for all time that that's how you cut up an idol. So basically, we'll stop there because it's already 9 35. But um, the idea yeah. is. Is it still early? <laughs> um, the, the idea is, and the the discussion's almost over over here. I mean, we can, but um, the idea is that Rabbi Yossi is trying to defend his position. If you want it in short, just our regular achas. Rabbi Yossi is trying to defend his position that if you need to get rid of an idol, an idolatrous substance or an idolatrous thing, you can grind it. That grinding is a sufficient mechanism. Um, to get rid of it, and he's being attacked by others who are saying it's not, and that's what the to and fro is. And next week there'll be a piece that comes from Shmuel and Divrei Ayomim with King David. David Amelech destroyed some of the Zara that belonged to the Plishtim. Um, he found some innocent Philistines that were <laughs> innocent civilians that were serving Avodah Zara, and David Amelech after waging a war. He destroyed their avoid Zaras, and that's the next proof. We'll do it next week that the Gomorrah wants to say, but look, that's what King David did. He also chopped up um, yeah, idolatrous right. stuff. Yeah, that, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's, interesting. it's interesting that Avram is not, uh, that story doesn't come up here. It came up in another place, in another context, but funnily enough, I'm not sure why, not over here. I'm trying to think why, because it's before uh, the Torah wasn't given yet to so somebody, I don't know. Yeah, yes. Sorry, Rabbi, yeah. if you're walking past your neighbor and he's got a garden gnome and you start buying to it and you want to make it you know, avoid his order, does that not count because you don't own it? And he owns it. Your neighbor owns the garden. Yeah, so, yeah, so bowing so bowing probably is still too indirect. You don't you don't own it, and therefore it doesn't mean that that, that your act is not the, that your act could be a prohibition. But we're talking about whether your act has an effect. On the item, you know, in in no, halacha, so Jewish law always. Sorry, that only applies to. We're talking about it only applies to Jews. No, there yeah. are there are certain isurim of avoid zara that apply to non-Jews as well. Because they are slightly they different from the Jews. The avoid zara as such, the statue, whatever it might be, they use it at the temple or wherever. Yeah, they, look, some have it around so it. They don't own yeah. it as such. Yeah, yeah. and according to the Noachat laws, would there, would there be a problem? There would be a problem because they yeah. also commanded to believe in God and not in Avodah Zarah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the difference is, though, that they are allowed a certain leeway in terms of Shetov, as we said before, which basically means that they are allowed to accept that certain things in the world have been given agency by God. Like whereas they have never Shetov with the issue. Sorry. So, and that's that's where that's probably the basis of the argument over whether or not it's full on Avodah Zarah. Where is yeah? Where, where, it would be like a church. I mean, the, the hanging piece is not <laughs> yeah. The angels, yeah, yeah. yeah. Idol as such. It's just a reminder of him. Or whatever. I'd, 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 I'd rather not take any chances if I win. No, no, I'm saying for in, in terms of them. They don't well, you know, you know we can we can end off on a joke. I know it's an old one. Some of you might have heard it many years ago. You know, it's a small town, and A.B. Cohen decides to see what it's like in church because obviously he wants to. You know, it's interesting, and he seats himself for one day. And the pastor's a little bit uncomfortable. Like, what is that you're doing in the church? 
So he tries to hint nicely. He says, you know, those that aren't members aren't really allowed to partake in the services. But he's remained sitting. And he says, those that didn't book, he's still sitting. So eventually he gets frustrated and he says, all Jews, please get out of here. So Abi gets up very calmly and he walks up to the victims. He's attacking me. There's, there was a bust of Yoshka Pandrel in the front. He picks it up. He says, come boy chick, they don't want us here.